Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 86, Home Theater editor Rob Sabin and I take questions from the chat room. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded November 7th, 2011, episode 86, chat room Q&A. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Ford, featuring voice-activated Sync App Link. Now you can control select smartphone apps with your voice, so you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Check it out in the 2012 Ford Fiesta and at Ford.com slash technology. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, online editor of hometheater.com. This week, I'm going to be answering questions from the chat room, and joining me for that is uh, the editor of Home Theater, Rob Sabin. Hey, Rob, welcome back to the show. Oh, hi, Scott. Good to be back. Yeah, thanks so much for joining me. Um, as I said, we're going to just be answering questions from the chat room this hour. We do this once in a while uh, because, uh, well, we like to help people, and uh, this is certainly one good way to do it. So um, let's see if we got here. Um, <clears throat> Well, actually, the first question that, that came up was, how about a stupid question? And uh, I want to make sure that everybody understands that as far as I'm concerned, there's no such thing as a stupid question, at least when it comes to home theater. Wouldn't you agree, Rob? I think that uh, anything at all that pops into your mind is, is fair game. So, Absolutely. Um, so uh, let's see if we can get started here. Uh, why is THX not uses anymore? Well, I don't understand that question. Um, <clears throat> what headphones am I using? Hey, there's a good question from uh, Web4074. I'm actually using um, B&W. Um, I believe they're called P5. I have to look and see here. Um, yeah, those are the P5s. P5s, yeah, Bauer and Wilkins. Um, excellent headphones. Uh, they're intended for uh, portable applications. They're kind of small but they're very sturdy. Have you tried them, Rob? Yeah, I have. It's a wonderful sounding headphone. Great, great, you know, musical mid-range, very nice, delicate, high-end. Uh, you know, what you'd expect from the B&W brand, actually. Yeah, exactly. The only thing I don't uh, including like Including the price tag. <laughs> yes, yes. I don't remember how, how, how much they are. I think they are, uh, aren't they 400 or 300? Yeah, they're a few hundred bucks. A few hundred yeah, bucks. Yeah, it's either three or 400 dollars. Yeah, the one thing I don't like about them is that they are on ear, um, and and there isn't really a hole, so so your whole ear is in contact with the surface. Now the the, the surface material is pretty soft, but I generally prefer what are called circumoral or around the ear uh, headphones. Um, but uh, these are the ones I have on hand at the moment, and they actually sound really good. And for an hour at the, of a podcast, they're totally fine. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Ken Crayley asks, uh, with the RED cameras coming out soon, actually they're out now, and being used for feature films, how long will it be before we see 4K or 8K in the home? Oh, well, wow. Ken, Ken is really jumping, uh, jumping the gun here a little bit on a bunch of coverage that we are planning. So we can't talk too much about it yet, but um, I think we can say... Certainly, we saw a couple of 4K projectors at Cedia. So the display side of things is actually moving faster than I thought. Wouldn't you say, Rob? Oh, yeah, no question about it. We weren't entirely sure if we were even going to see 4K at the show. And, of course, we had uh, the two primary entries being uh, the JVC sort of uh, 4K uh, uh, variation, if you will, which is yeah. uh, kind of an upscaled thing. Uh, but then, of course, is the Sony 4K uh, native projector, which, uh, you know, as, as you know, we are doing our best to uh, get into the pipeline for our readers. Yes, 
and uh, we certainly want to cover 4K as much as possible. Uh, and as I said, the display side is is really heating up with the JVC, which is sort of pseudo 4K, otherwise known as Quad HD, because it's really four times the vertical and horizontal uh, resolution of HD, whereas true 4K is even a little more than that, which is what the Sony is. Also, the Sony will accept a 4K signal, whereas the JVC won't. It will only accept uh, 1080p or high def and um, then upscale that. But the real yeah. question, the real question, Rob, uh, that we really don't know the answer to yet is how is 4K going to be delivered to the home? Well, you know, I think the great likelihood, and, and it really is conjecture at this point, but based upon the research that we've already done, uh, we know that Blu-ray can handle 4K. Um, and that is probably the likely scenario, but we are a ways away from that. The, uh, there is currently no 4K standard for Blu-ray. Uh, getting one is going to involve having all of the companies in the Blu-ray uh, consortium getting together and deciding that it's time to have that. And mm -hmm. uh, I think we know from the people we're talking to, uh, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg. They're not going to, those companies, are uh, until they have product out there, uh, are not going to be that interested necessarily in putting the effort into making that standard happen. Uh, and of course, you know, you, uh, you know, you won't have the, the content until this product out in the field. So it's, it's uh, that, the, the classic chicken and egg situation. But I think Blu-ray is, is the great likelihood. Streaming, uh, not really gonna, gonna fly. There's just not enough bandwidth available right now. Even with just regular HD, I, I know a lot of our readers are running into bandwidth limitations and uh, the ISPs uh, putting, putting a limit on what they can do. So yeah. the idea Can you imagine of 4K, hitting a 250 gigabyte cap oh my with gosh, a 4K yeah. stream? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it would, you'd be about five minutes into the movie before it finally <laughs> stopped on you. Uh, oh, but, you know, I can, we, we can address there. There is a little bit. I know that the, the question earlier was also about when are we going to actually see 4K content? Part mm -hmm. of that story is how much 4K content is being created. Because, you know, the, the original question was, was, was about the camera. That's coming right. You got out. the and red course, camera, which will do 4K. The new, right. uh, the new one, I forget the name of it, will do 5K, actually. Oh, that's right. And then there's the Sony camera that's coming out as well. Sony has right. uh, a new camera, mm -hmm. yes, which is also uh, 4K capable. Actually, deep, right. more than 4K. I think that might be an 8K camera uh, for, for uh, purposes I of don't, capture. Yeah, I don't recall now. But in any event, um, mm -hmm. you're right. We do have the cameras to capture. Mm -hmm. and right. um, But there aren't. But not only do you have to capture it in 4K, but you also have to then treat it in 4K all along the production line from well, digital intermediates to editing and all kinds of stuff like that. So um, that th there's a whole workflow that needs to be implemented by the studios before we, re we see genuine 4K content come out in, in a lot in big numbers. We have about, what, 70 films currently getting the 4K treatment, have, have gotten it so far? Well, that's, that's about right, and, and, and I think that's really the good news is because what's happening now is that virtually everything that's being shot in film is being brought into uh, the digital realm in 4K, so at least yeah. there's archival material there that's going to help us uh, have that content for the future when everything is in place. But uh, right now what you're going to see is that a lot of that content will start in 4K and actually just be brought down to 2K for purpose of the workflow and, and the final product. Uh, later on, when there's more uh, displays out there, you'll see, the op you'll see that they'll take, the studios take the opportunity to release those things. Right. Um, you know, they'll, they'll sell us everything in 2K first and regular HDTV, and then <laughs> when they have a chance to sell us the same title again, of you know, course. it'll be seen. Vinyl and CDs all over. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, Shakes in the chat room says uh, he needs an HDMI switch, bro switch box. Uh, what brand, 1080p, and remote? Now, I know that we have here at the studio, we have a, an HDMI switcher by Axel, A-C-C-E-L-L, um, which is an HDMI 1.3. So it actually sometimes passes 3D, but sometimes doesn't. Um, so we actually need to update that, but uh, I, I've liked that one quite a bit. It's, it works very well. There are plenty of other companies. Rob, have you uh, worked with any HDMI switchers? 
Yeah, you know, Key Digital makes a good switcher. Um, you know, there's a couple of interesting new HDMI switchers that are out right now. And there was one that was introduced at the show by uh, the folks at DVDO. That's, of course, Silicon Image. So I'm right. not sure if this is a Silicon Image branded product or if it's a DVDO branded product. But uh, what's happening with a lot of the new HDMI switchers is that uh, they are basically being built so that the switcher is acknowledging through its EDID ports uh the different uh displays that are on it so right by the way that. EDID EDID stands for extended display identification just for those who don't know right right and and, and, it's, and the it's a message that the that the display sends right. back along HDMI to the thing that's sending it stuff that tells the sender these are my capabilities this is my resolution that, this is what I can handle that's right and and part of that is that there's also a handshake that takes place uh where uh, the uh, source device has to really get the acknowledgement back from the display that it's copyright protected and it's okay for me to send my signal. And what they're right. doing is build, they're building into these switchers now that capability. So what happens is that once you set the unit up, you power it up once, it'll basically go out and look at all the displays. Once it's made that connection once, now going forward, every time it needs to switch from, let's say, HDMI output number one to HDMI output number three, that can happen much more rapidly in this new generation of switchers. And uh, that's a really interesting, if you really are, you know, you're, you're dealing with a switcher, maybe one in, four out, um, it's nice well, I would to call, have. I would call that a distribution amp, not a switcher. Well, you know, it's a, it, it's a distro. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, yeah. Yeah, as, as a, yeah, because there's two different functions here that we're talking about. One is if you have a bunch of HDMI sources and say your receiver's older and it doesn't have a bunch of HDMI switching in it, you can use one of these external HDMI switchers to switch a bunch of sources into one output. It, then it's there's a single. The, right. Then there's the distribution amp, if you will, it's an older term for it, that takes one input, or in some cases, one of several inputs, and sends it out to multiple displays. Right, right, right. So, so and, and yeah, there's, a, there's a place for that as well. I mean, one of the classic examples is if you have a home theater with a projector, but you don't want to use the projector during the day, say, because you've got a bunch of windows around, you can't really control your ambient light, so you use a flat panel during the day, but the projector at night. And so you need two HDMI outputs for that so that you can send one signal to the flat panel, another one to the projector. So that's a very common application that a lot of people use for a, um, uh, for a distribution amp, such as you were saying. Sure, exactly. Yeah, no, I was getting a little bit confused with the functionality there. My, my custom install stuff was kicking in. We uh, right. <laughs> were, were, were doing whole house uh, video distribution. It happened to have been one of the more interesting uh, switching products that I saw at the at the CDA show. So I agree with you. By the way, that that DVDO or silicon silicon image or whatever they're going to call it uh, is a great looking. Um, sw I don't remember if it was a switcher or a distributor or both. No, th that was a it was a two in. I believe it was a two in four out. Is four out. Uh, what I okay. think that might have been. Yeah. Right. Web three sixty four asks, um, looking for a good forty two inch TV, but still on the cheap. <laughs> well, uh, we. Oh, uh, you know, we we look at 42 inches. That's kind of the small end of what we generally look at. Um, I, you know, I'm I'm always a fan of Panasonic plasmas, uh, and they they are pretty inexpensive these days. I mean, even the 50 inch uh, ST30, uh, which we reviewed some time ago, uh, lists for 1300, and you can get it for probably under a thousand at this point. Um, what's your feeling on uh, good quality, inexpensive 42 inches? That really would have been my first recommendation, too. And uh, whether you go for, I'm not sure if the ST has a 42, uh, ST series has a 42 inch. It might I actually. I think it does. I think it does, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a 3D set that would be a very reasonable price. But even if you go below that to the non 3D Panasonics, they really represent a terrific value. Uh, you won't they get really the same do. performance as you would out of the ST series, but always, always a really good looking picture for, for not yeah, a lot I've of money coming from those Panasonic sets. Yeah, I'm actually in the process at the moment of reviewing the 50S30, not the ST30, but the S30, ah, which is right. a lower cost unit, not 3D, um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but a popular uh, display that a lot of people are buying. So I thought, you know what, I should check it out. And I'm not done with the review yet, but what I've found so far, I've been pretty impressed. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, I'd, I'd say you can't go wrong with Panasonic. If you want to go LED L or LCD, um, either Sony or Samsung, you're not going to be able to go wrong there. Sony is going to probably command a bit of a premium just because they're Sony. Um, but uh, they're generally very good sets. Um, Vizio, I think, is a very good value, generally speaking. I'm about to get a Vizio in for, uh, for review, a 3D model. Um, so I haven't looked at a Vizio in a while, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, they make um, a terrific TV as well. Yeah, exactly right. And again, a good value. Uh, let's see. What is the opt? Let's see. Web forty-seven fifty-four. What is the optimal amount to spend on a home theater system? In other words, at what point will the non-audio video file not notice the difference? Well, that's a pretty good question. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting one. Yeah, where's the where's the point of uh, diminishing returns? <laughs> it's a pretty big question, though, because you got you need to think about it in terms of displays and in terms of audio systems. Yeah, you know what? I, um, I have uh, always thought that it's very much a, a learned experience, too. So you should never really sell yourself short and end up uh, buying less than you would spend because you don't think you have the ears for it. Uh, it, it it's almost like you get used to watching, you know, or you, let's say you're listening to your clock radio, and then all of a sudden you get a good audio system. You suddenly notice that your clock radio really doesn't sound very good. And, uh, <laughs> So, so I never discourage anyone from spending money, but I would say, you know, if, if it, when my friends come to me and said, I, I really want to put a system together, what should I do? How much should I spend? Of course, the first question you have to ask them is what are your needs? Is it a situation where you're really not in a position to set up a, a receiver and a, a surround sound speaker package? You have to have a, an all in one unit if it's a sound bar or, or uh, some kind of an HDIB integrated system. So uh, assuming that we're talking about a basic component system, um, I would say that you're probably looking at $1,500 to $2,000 to really get, uh, you don't need to, but that's a really good high performance system. And when, I, when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about perhaps a, a, a five to $600 receiver, which gets you past the point in Navy receivers where you're, you're talking about not having quite enough power to really uh, have the authority that you need to, to do what some of these soundtracks demand of it. Those smaller receivers, when you get to the less expensive units, tend to run out of steam when you push them a little bit hard with these, um, these heavy-duty uh, uh, lossless soundtracks. And um, uh, so having a receiver at least in the $600 range, one that hopefully has been tested by us and rated well in the, in the uh, measurements, it's a good place to start. You know, from there, you don't need to spend a lot for a Blu-ray player. You're probably looking at uh, maybe... 100, 100 bucks, uh, maybe? Yeah, honestly, you know, 100, one to, $150. One to two, dollars. certainly no more than two. Yeah, and, and, and at that point, then you've got a TV and speakers, right? So let's, right. let's kind of figure it out. Let's call it 1000 bucks for a TV. Um, yep. So I guess, you know, that leaves you about $300 for speakers. I probably, I probably underestimated a little bit. Maybe a little uh, bit. I, you know, okay. our compact speaker uh, top picks, uh, the Pioneers, uh, they're called... Actually, the, they're, they're like five, 600 bucks. Yeah, I was just going to say that Pioneer system is a perfect example of a great, great value. And actually, all of the major brands that we, uh, generally speaking, uh, review and, and in, in a positive way most of the time, have um, some lower end speakers, uh, uh, speaker kits that you can buy for somewhere around $600 or so. So um, it's actually, I think it's actually less, Scott, for that Pioneer, uh, that Pioneer budget system. It might be about $400 for the entire mm. thing. So mm. um, really, uh, there are great values out there if you know what to buy. But, but that puts you in a pretty good realm where, you know, you're going to have something that's really quite impressive. Uh, mm -hmm. Beyond that, you know, um, I, I guess, you know, you could spend about five or $600 on a sound bar uh, and, and not really have real surround sound, but probably have a, a very nice room filling musical sound that would be great for listening to your iTunes as well. So, Sure. Um, got a couple questions in here about HDMI cables, uh, which is a great, great subject. Um, uh, Tony Mac. Tommy Mac, sorry, asks, uh, are nine, $9 HDMI cables from Amazon just as good as Monster Brand? Oh, that's a uh, good question, too. And, and uh, JC asks, asks about Monoprice, which is where I uh, often recommend people go to get their HDMI cables. But the real question is, do you have, are, are expensive HDMI cables significantly better performers than, than the cheapies? 
What's what's your answer to that question? I know you probably get it all the time too. Sure, and and you know what? It's a and and first of all, I have to preface this by saying that everybody has an opinion as far as cables are concerned. Um, no kidding. <laughs> Okay, so that's a controversial topic, but I've, I've gone on record even in the pages of the magazine with where I stand on this, particularly with regard to HDMI cables. Um, and it's born partly from my experience as, as an installer and uh, also just from years and years of being around high-end audio systems of very different levels of performance. Um, the thing with HDMI is, 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 is two issues really immediately to be concerned about. And the first thing is the general overall length of the cable, because the longer the cable is, the more important it is to probably spend a little bit more to make sure that you're getting a good cable. Uh, I agree. A ca I agree. A ca right? So, so the yep. first thing is get a cable that's rated for what you need it to do. Uh, and if it's, if it's a long cable, um, and when I say long, I mean anything over 15 feet, you know, they make these cables up to up to uh, 10 meters or more sometimes, meaning 35 to sometimes as much as 50 feet. I have actually run in some instances 50 foot HDMI 50 cables. feet of HDMI, really? 50 feet, and not had a problem. But I will tell you that it's not something that you want to do without some kind of backup. And when I say that, uh, I'm talking about if you're doing that kind of a run uh, with, uh, because you have to get a signal of a great long distance, and you need to uh, make sure that you have a great signal because you can't know for sure when you get that 50 foot cable plugged in whether you're gonna end up with uh, either, whether it's even gonna fully connect to the devices and actually make the connection because if the signal is too low, they won't even complete the handshake. And then right. uh, beyond that, you can get sparklies, which is the most common type of artifact that you get when you have too long a cable. You'll see on dark backgrounds, uh, video noise. It looks like snow. And yeah. uh, that's unacceptable. So what you typically do, or what I've always done in, in a long distance run, is I will run a pair of Cat5 wires along with the HDMI cable. And that pair of Cat5 wires can be used for an HDMI balance kit, which is about right. a $200, $250 thing if you need it. Uh, but um, ultimately, you can get a great signal. And most of the time, you know, you can even skip the long cable and just go with the HDMI balance. But um, depending upon how costly that 50-foot cable is. But, uh, uh, you know, I don't recommend running 50 feet or even really 10 meters, which would be 35 feet. Anything right. over 15 feet, uh, you want to make sure you've got a good quality cable. Make sure that you've got good. The second part of it is good mechanical connection. Because right. uh, that is the one key difference between a very inexpensive cable and a better made name brand cable is usually uh, the connectors and the terminations are done with much greater efficacy and, uh, and, and just, they're just built better. Uh, and you want to make sure that you, you have a good connection. Right. So uh, right. beyond that, very, very hard to tell the difference. There are some people that would argue differently, but uh, <laughs> uh, from an audio stand, uh, video standpoint, you're going to have a rough time to, uh, you know, telling what the difference is. Right, exactly. Um, as I'm scanning down the chat room here, I'm seeing uh, a number of people chiming in about some 4K things. We'll get back to that and here. We'll return to that here. Um, uh, Keith 512 asks, why not just use BDXL, which is the rewritable, uh, writable, recordable format. I don't know if it's rewritable, but it's recordable anyway. Um, and does four layers at 100 gigabytes. And the problem with that is that at the moment, it's only a recordable format. It's not a ROM format. So um, uh, manufacturing of that is uh, not standardized at all. So we, we don't expect to see that um, anytime soon. Uh, Blade Relic in the chat room asks, I keep seeing ads for LED TVs. Are the screens actually LED? Are they, or are they referring only to the backlight? <laughs> this is one of the most common <laughs> questions I get, certainly. And one of the problems I have with the marketing people who say that, oh, we, we're making LED TVs, because that's a little bit of a misnomer, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's just, uh, it, it, it's, it's really all marketing hype. And at the end of the day, I really sort of pity the consumer who doesn't uh, come in really understanding this fully. But uh, to answer the question, LED refers specifically to the backlight uh, on the latest generation of LCD TVs. And the most important thing to know about it is that there are really primarily two different types of LED backlights. And one of them uh, is responsible for the ultimate 
in LCD performance. And the other really represents uh, not such a great fix as we found out in our reviews. And, uh, you know, those, those two types are edge lit and full array uh, local dimming. Um, so, you know, Scott, do you want to pick up on there and explain what uh, one of those is? Sure, sure. Um, the, the, the most expensive way to do it and the best quality way to do it is with uh, LED backlights in which you have an array of LEDs, typically white ones, <clears throat> um, uh, behind the LCD screen, which is still producing the picture. And this allows a really cool feature called local dimming. And what that does is when you have a scene on the screen in the LCD screen, a high resolution image in which some parts are dark, say they're, it's at night, other parts are bright, say a brightly lit storefront or house or something, um, then the LEDs behind the dark part can be dimmed independently while the LEDs behind the bright part of the image can be brightened, which gives you greater contrast and um, <clears throat> better blacks. It really looks great. It does have one potential problem, which is that um, you can often get halos around very small bright objects like say stars on a black background of the black of space. Um, because the LED zones, the areas of LED that can be dimmed and brightened individually are much larger, much larger than the individual pixels in the picture, uh, then sometimes if you have a bright little point of light on an otherwise black background, the LEDs behind that point of light are striving to be brighter which means that the black around them is going to be brighter and you end up with, with what's called haloing. Uh, we've seen that in just about every backlit um, LCD, uh, LED L backlit LCD that we've looked at with the exception of right. the new, with the exception of the new Sharp Elite uh, LED backlit LCD TV, uh, <clears throat> which uh, I think you will agree, Rob, uh, we want to make sure everybody knows is going to be posted on our website, that review, um, in just a day or two. And, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we, we, we're really very excited. We have the first exclusive review of, of that, that uh, television. And, you know, I, I think I want to point out um, that when you talk about LEDs and their use in LCD televisions, the original promise of that was exactly what you described, uh, Scott, in the full array local dimming approach. And right. uh, that was the whole idea was that, gosh, you know, plasma gives you great blacks, but couldn't we get even better blacks out of uh, an LED TV where you could actually turn the backlight completely off? Uh, and those LEDs are very responsive. And, uh, you know, it kind of started out that way where we had the first few LED sets were full array local dimming TVs. And then all of a sudden, uh, because of the cost associated primarily with having all of those LEDs and all of the processing required to make it all work right, right. Uh, the, the industry turned to edge lit backlights. And right. uh, the, ed the edge lit lights, as we know, which basically have LEDs around the edge of the screen and then essentially use uh, a, a, an optical uh, diffractor to bring that uh, light into and behind the, the actual LCD crystals. Right. And they, they, they don't work that well. And the thinner the TVs get, the harder it is to do that effectively and with perfect consistency across the screen, which is why we complain about streakiness in, in the black and the dark scenes. Right, and une uneven, yeah, uneven illumination. It's, it's a real yeah. problem. Exactly. And uh, so, so I'm, I'm really, you know, this television, this new Sharp TV really turned out to be a revelation, I think. It, it, it was, we were hoping, of course, it's $6,000 for a 60-inch uh, a TV. Yeah. So an 80, I believe it was 8,500 for the 70-inch. So Yeah, I believe uh, that's not, correct. You, you know, true state-of-the-art, full array, local dimming, LCD. It is the LCD promise fulfilled is kind of how I've been referring to it because it's really what we always expect and hoped and wanted. And uh, it took a cost no object uh, design approach to really <clears throat> see what this concept was capable of. That right. television uh, has got super, super deep blacks. It has absolutely no haloing. And, nope. uh, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a function of, of both the LCD panel and some advancements that they've made in that. The great number, I think, of LEDs and the number of zones that they've got 
right. uh, behind the set. And then um, I'm sure the processing is just absolutely unbelievable in the TV. So uh, they've really done a great job with it. And that review will go up <clears throat> online just uh, in the next next few days. So uh, yeah, exactly. everybody should keep an eye out for it. It'll be the first one out there on that TV. Uh, David, uh, 1987, asks, what do you think of the Sharp Elite compared to the Pioneer Kuro? Which, of course, uh. is the... Which is, of course, the big question. And the good news is <clears throat> that reviewer Tom Norton has a 60-inch Kuro at his house, and he put the Sharp right next to it. And he yep. took a splitter, an HDMI splitter um, that we were talking about earlier, and fed the same signal to both. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, the uh, Sharp is 3D capable, so, and the Pioneer is not. So uh, there was that, there's that difference if you're interested in 3D. Um, but in terms of 2D performance, I, I spent some time over at Tom's house looking at the two side by side at the same image, and they're very comparable. I was uh, not particularly surprised to see that the uh, black level on the Sharp was l a slightly lower than the Kuro. Now, the Kuro's very low. The Sharp was even a little bit lower, but interestingly... It, it does not take its LEDs down to zero. It actually maintains a very slight bit of light there so that you don't think the TV's turned off. In a totally dark room now we're talking. We're talking about in a totally blacked out room. Um, you can still see that the TV is on, but it is a lower, a lower black level than even the, the Pioneer. Um, other, otherwise, there were a number of things... I would say they were, they're certainly absolutely comparable, without question. Um, I would be very happy living with that Sharp. Um, I live with a Kuro myself. I have a 50-inch because uh, I don't have room for a 60-inch, but uh, um, I'm, I've been exceedingly happy with that for the last three years or so. Um, but I'd be very happy living with the Sharp, too. Um, I think yeah. they are absolutely comparable. Yeah, I think the other thing, and you mentioned, of course, 3D. The fact is today, if they came out with a Kuro set, it would obviously, a uh, Kuro Plasma it would obviously be a 3D television, uh, right. but the other the other thing that I think was remarkable about the, the, this this Sharp is is the 3D performance, which uh, I know you got a chance. Oh, it was to great! See. Yeah, fabulous. It's 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 about the brightest 3D we've seen. You know that that new panel and the LEDs just really have a lot of headroom, and uh, it it was a, a revelatory uh, 3D experience for our, our reviewer. So yeah, uh, I oh think yeah, people will want, want to read about that. Yeah, absolutely so. Um, let's see. I know that Web4074 has been, been patiently reposting re his question, um, and I'm not, I'm not sure I can answer it because I don't know, but he has an Onkyo 6100 receiver with no H... Uh, that's, he says no HDMI, no HDMI out for about an hour after turning it on. So it sounds like the HDMI out is failing after about an hour. Um, any ideas why? No, it sounds like a fault. It sounds like you need to take it into a, a repair station uh, to uh, get that looked at, because that's certainly not normal behavior. Um, let's see. There was another question here that I could answer, uh, which was, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, isn't there an AVR that will upscale 1080p to 4K for a TV that does 4K? And the answer is yes, there is. We saw it at Cedia, as a matter of fact. Did you get a chance yeah. to see that, Rob? Yeah, that's uh, that. That basically is the Onkyo piece. I imagine the Integra has that yep. function as well, right? So yep. Uh, yep. the they version of do. it. Now, which model was it? I, was it more than one? It might have been the top two or three, actually. In the I new think it line. was. Uh, I know that in the Integra line, it's anything, any model number that ends in point three, which is mm -hmm. their newest model model designation. Last mm -hmm. year was point two. The year before that was point one. So I guess they're. Uh, adopting that as a format, but um, anything with point three on it, including their preamp processors and their AVRs, uh, have this 4, 4K upscaling, and that's Integra. And Onkyo, which is a company, a brand related to Integra, they're both sort of under the same roof, uh, also does 4K scaling in its higher end, um, uh, <clears throat> in its higher end products. Beatmaster now, asks, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask you, Scott. So, what you know, the one thing that the question that was never answered for me is is what do you do with that 4K output? You need to have a 4K mm -hmm. display for it. Yep. They're just anticipating the future with it right now, right? Exactly. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, you need to have a 4K display, 
or else there's no point. And Beatmaster asks a related question. Doesn't the constant upscaling for 4K TVs cause more troubles? And uh, the answer is we don't know yet. But certainly any, any time you do upscaling, you have the potential for upscaling artifacts, difficulties. You know, it depends on how well it does it. So uh, I'm certainly looking forward to when we get the Sony 4K projector in here, uh, looking at upscaled 1080p and seeing if we can, you know, see scaling artifacts. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, the thing about scaling is, is it, it, it creates trouble only if you do it badly. And uh, doing it well can sometimes be expensive, although it has gotten less and less costly as time has gone on and there have been more and more uh, chips put out in the marketplace for manufacturers that uh, uh, do, this, do, do this and do this well. Uh, mm -hmm. The interesting thing about scaling, though, is that a lot of it has to do with what you're scaling from and what you're scaling to. So, for example, if you're scaling from 720p to, uh, to 1080, uh, you have a very uneven algorithm there, and it requires uh, that it be done a little bit more carefully. Uh, That's a good if point. So if you're going from 2K to 4K, now, of course, don't forget that 1080p really isn't exactly, <laughs> exactly true 2K. That's a good uh, point. Not the way the manufacturers are sort of defining it. Uh, there's a couple of different definitions of it. But um, uh, if you're doing a fairly even doubling, if you will, of pixels, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, there's less opportunity to introduce artifacts in the Exactly, situation. which is one reason, one reason why the JVC projectors uh, that are called 4K but are really quad HD, I think the resolution is 3840 by 2160, something like that. It's exactly double... Uh, the horizontal resolution and double the vertical resolution. Uh, they may, in fact, do better on uh, Blu-ray and 1080, 1080i, 1080p content because the upscaling is so nice and simple and even. Right. Well, we got a ton more questions in the chat room, and I'm gonna we're gonna get right back to it. But for um, just for the moment, I want to take this moment and thank uh, one of our sponsors for this episode, uh, which is Ford, featuring the um, voice-activated Sync App Link feature, which is really pretty damn cool. Uh, it enables you to select apps from your smartphone with simple voice commands while you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Very important for safety. Uh, you can voice control Pan, uh, Pandora in your car. You can listen to your tweets with OpenBeak. Very cool. And once your smartphone is linked to Pandora, for example, you can use voice commands like select your favorite station, make a new one, bookmark songs to purchase, give a song a thumbs up or thumbs down. It's just, uh, it's just, we're getting into this era of voice command and it's, uh, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, you can say with OpenBeak, for example, read timelines or read replies. Um, uh, Sync with uh, AppLink is built, uh, built on an API uh, platform that allows Ford to continue to work with uh, developers in the app community to bring apps to life with voice in their vehicles. Now, what's most interesting, uh, the, the Sync with AppLink is available in uh, the 2012 Ford Fiesta, and you can learn more about it. Uh, and other technologies that Ford is bringing to market at Ford.com slash technology. What's most interesting here f at the moment is that Ford is sponsoring a, <clears throat> a barbecue at the Twit Studios in Petaluma. So if you happen to be in the area, you really should drop by. Um, <clears throat> they're doing two barbecues, actually, one on Sunday, November 13th which is coming up pretty soon. And the next one on Sunday, December 4th, both starting at 1.30 p.m. Uh, you'll have a chance to meet and uh, meet some of the Twit hosts. Leo certainly will be there. And uh, you can even check out some of the Fords that, that will be there as well. If you'd like to join us, please go to twit.tv to request tickets. We'd love to see you there. And we thank Ford for their uh, support of Twit and for bringing us the Twit Sunday Barbecues. So let's get right back to the questions. I've got so many more than we're going to be able to answer, but uh, we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, Beatmaster asks, Samsung still selling their plasmas for cheap too. A good brand for plasma still? Question mark. I think oh. so. 
Oh, yeah. Actually, I have some personal experience with that. Uh, that those TVs, in particular, their top-of-the-line sets are really, really outstanding, outstanding uh, plasmas. Uh, we did just post up our review of the uh, 8000 series, uh, I believe. Oh, in yeah, the their, their flagship size, plasma. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. 59-inch, uh, yeah. It's a 59, right. So, um, the... Um, you know, what's really great about those Samsung plasmas, first of all, is that the form factor is absolutely outstanding on those TVs. They are very, they're an inch and a half thin, which is basically looks like an LED set, you know. Yeah. So uh, if you happen to be in a situation where you're hanging a television uh, in a place where you see the side of the TV when you enter the room, that's a great option uh, for cosmetics that allows you to have that plasma picture that so many of us love without... Uh, having to go to an, uh, a real LED set. So, mm -hmm. uh, and actually the color on those uh, Samsungs is really, really outstanding. 3D quality is very, very good. Uh, the black levels are not quite up to the top of the line uh, Panasonics, uh, but it's not anything that's so far off that uh, if you appreciate the form factor and the, and the uh, other features in those TVs, those Samsung sets that you, you would necessarily feel like you had to go to the panty. And, right. uh, you know, the other thing, too, is that we've talked, I think, on the show before about the really outstanding uh, app platform that uh, Samsung has put together for all of its televisions, all of its smart TVs. Uh, and Blu-ray players, for that matter. Yeah, and Blu-ray players have a huge number of, of uh, streaming apps available. Um, and that's, that's and a, that's I think a, they're very well implemented as well. Floop in the chat room asks, do different Netflix players look better than others? Um, and the answer oh is yes, they do. And, and in, in particular, even more so than, than the content looking different, the user interface is significantly different. And I'm quite surprised at that, actually. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that you see so many different uh, executions of this. And, uh, you know, user friendliness is one of the, one of the key things with uh, these, these online platforms. Um, as far as the picture quality is concerned, uh, the thing that's going to always most affect the picture quality on streaming is what your bandwidth is at that particular moment or what your bitstream is like and how much uh, how much of a pipeline you're actually getting from your uh, your ISP and, and what they're able to put out from the Netflix right. servers and everything exactly else. Exactly so, so. So there's a great variation there. But, um, you know, certainly the... the, the uh, the ergonomic aspects of it are something to take a look at, too. And often no way to really know that except to read a review or, at, or go somewhere where you can play with the TV and see what it's like. Yeah, exactly right. A couple of projector questions. Uh, D. Tommy D. asks, uh, what is the current state of LED projectors and what is the future there? Mm. Yeah, um, interesting. Now, you know, Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, there, 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 we're seeing more and more LED projectors so far. Uh, I don't believe that any of the LED projectors that we've seen have have uh, delivered the performance that we we get typically from from a, a regular uh, lamp based projector. But uh, there's more and more coming down the pike, and we're going to continue to look at them. The the big problem, of course, there is that LED projectors don't output as much light. That's as, it. As the lamp based uh, projectors do, and that's their big drawback. Their big advantage, of course, is you don't have to replace the lamp every couple of years or every few thousand hours or even a hundred hours, a few hundred hours. Um, so it's a trade-off for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Web uh, 4659 uh, asks, uh, is a low-end projector better than a television? <laughs> 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 I would have to say, well, it depends. Um, depends, for one depends thing. who you ask. Yeah, yeah. Well, plus the fact it depends on your room environment. If you can totally control the light, uh, the ambient light in your room, then uh, you have you have a good chance of getting a good image. Uh, although the low-end projectors won't have as good a black level, uh, they won't be as bright. Um, I've looked at a couple of really inexpensive projectors lately and really wanted them to be to be good performers so I could recommend them. And unfortunately, I was unable to recommend them in good conscience. Um, on the other hand, they give you a nice big picture. But boy, you better have a totally light-controlled room uh, if you're going to even hope to compete with a television. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's really very much about uh, the experience and, and the immersive experience of it. TVs and projectors, they're really two different animals. Uh, if you have a... 
uh, a projector, you're not probably not going to want it. Even if you can control the light, you're probably not going to want it for your day-to-day -day just TV viewing, and uh, because it's it's too difficult to shut down the lights and be able to get a decent picture all the time. And you know, it's kind of an experience. But there is nothing that really replaces that immersive front projection experience. And uh, so, so it's really six and one half a dozen uh, of the others. That's why you do see a lot of uh, a lot of installations where you've got a flat panel that's on the wall and when you hit the button you know the screen comes down in front of it uh because you're ready for movie night you know yeah yeah exactly um <clears throat> let's see murdoch three uh, has been patiently repeating his question uh why is thx not used as much as dolby digital and i have to say this is a very interesting question because um it's, it's a very common misconception among uh consumers that THX and Dolby Digital are somehow equivalent. Unfortunately, they aren't. <laughs> well, that's right. Uh, now, of course, if you're talking about DTS and Dolby, you know, you're talking about one of the great uh, rivalries that goes down with Coke and Pepsi and all mm -hmm. the rest of them. Uh, but uh, THX really, you know, those there are THX processing modes uh, within AVRs and receivers and um, uh, that that basically are an enhancement of of you know Dolby Digital or other things, but uh, generally speaking, you know DTS and Dolby are in essence soundtrack uh, algorithms that are used to uh, right. lay sound down on uh, on discs and. Um, and that's, THX that's is, really a, is a post-processing mode in the receiver that will do something to that um, to that sound after the fact. But but you're right. You're comparing apples and oranges here with THX and Dolby Digital. They're not the same thing. Right. Oh, here's a great question from Eric Duckman. Um, how do you determine viewing distance for a screen size? I've seen lots of charts and formulas and get different numbers. Also, lots of my TV viewing is still SD. So I don't want to be too close, right? Well, the answer is yes. You don't want to be too close with SD. Uh, but you can be a lot closer with HD than you can with SD because the pixels are smaller, a lot smaller. Um, so um, my favorite, uh, actually, my favorite um, screen distance calculator, and you're right, there are different, uh, different ways of calculating it, and you get different results. Um, but I'm just looking up right now. Uh, my favorite one is from um, a place called myhometheater.homestead.com slash viewing distance calculator. And uh, let's see here. Uh, you just, all you do is you put in your uh, viewing distance if you have it. You choose whether or not you're looking at 16 by 9 or 4 by 3. Um, you specify your screen size, and it gives you all the different recommended viewing distances. Because SMPTE, the um, Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, and THX both have their own um, recommended optimum distance. So um, you're right. There are several different uh, ways to calculate that. Generally speaking, I go for the... Um, the SMPTE recommendation, which is a 30 degree viewing angle. Uh, and so at a, dis at, at a screen size of say 60 inches and a 16 by nine uh, set, uh, that distance is about eight feet, a lot closer than you expect. Have you, did you find that Rob in your uh, installation business that uh, people tended to sit farther away from their TVs than than the optimum distance? Yeah, I think lifestyle has a way of, of kind of getting in the way of that. Um, you know, the only time that you start to really approach the appropriate distances is in a dedicated theater room uh, where presumably it's all been planned out. But uh, it, it becomes very, very difficult because unless you've got a really, really big screen, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to... Um, uh, really subtend those kinds of viewing angles uh, right. without, you know, in, in a normal room, let's put it that way. Uh, right. You know, a lot, a lot of TVs these days especially get put in these very large family rooms. So, um, you know, it really just depends on where you can put the seating and, 
and and that is the defining factor, not you know what is yeah. best. Oh, by the way, I want I wanted to make a point. You were talking earlier about mounting um, flat panels on the wall, and they're getting so thin now that it you know sort of looks like a framed picture on the wall. I just wanted to make an appeal to everyone, anyone who's thinking of doing that, don't put it over the fireplace. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> This really bugs That's, me. And it's not why you think. It's not because of the heat. You know, you, you, it's possible if you have like a glass heat radiator in front of your fireplace that you could actually be pumping heat up, up onto the, to the display. But it's really more an ergonomic thing. Because if you put that, fi that flat panel above the fireplace, you're craning your neck to watch it. And after mm -hmm. a two-hour movie, I guarantee you're going to have a, a sore neck. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's a terrible mistake that a lot of people make uh, because it just happens to be the logical place in the room. But there really are. There are three considerations to putting your TV above a fireplace. The first one, as you suggested, is heat, because at the end of the day, uh, if you have a fireplace and, and they're all different, you know, it depends upon how the heat comes out and what kind of a mantle you have to potentially block that and divert it off of where the TV would be. Uh, so the first thing that you have to do is put up a, uh, if, you, if you are going to try to do something like that, is you've got to see what kind of heat comes off of it. And, uh, you know, you can do that with an electronic thermometer, get the fireplace going. If it gets up over 98 or 100 degrees, you know, you don't want it really anything over 85 to 90 degrees. Uh, you're, you're asking for trouble in terms of the life of the TV. The second thing is, can you get wires to it? Because there's always a lot of issues with getting wires behind a fireplace. Oh, that's uh, a good point. Yeah, and, and above a fireplace. You can't come up from the basement. There's usually a hearth there. You might be able to come, you know, down, but, uh, you know, how do you get everything in there? So it's always, that's always tricky. And there's a lot of brick sometimes above fireplaces. That could also be an issue. And then the, the most important thing is what you mentioned, Scott, which is how uncomfortable it is to watch a television. And there are fireplaces that are low fireplaces. And if your seating distance is far enough away to where you can be comfortable, then it's an option. Mm -hmm. But you got to be really, really careful about it. And uh, I will just point out one product, brand new product that's out. It's one of those, why didn't they do this sooner type things? But there is a company called Comfort View, C-O-M-F-O-R-T-V-U, uh, mm. that has created a dedicated mechanized mount intended precisely for mounting above a fireplace. When you hit the button, it's a motorized mount. It brings the TV out and down. And uh, it's, you know, the perfect solution for a situation where you really have no choice but to put it above the fireplace. It's a few hundred bucks, that mount. Not a cheap mm. mount, but um, uh, definitely a, a very interesting solution. It's comfortview.com. Mm. Wow, that's great. You still have to look upward a little bit, but at least it angles the TV down so that you're looking right at it. Oh, no. This actually takes the TV, brings it out several inches, and drops oh, it. Oh, so, and then drops it down. Yeah, oh, well, that's a, way cool. They have a video on their website that shows you how it works. Oh, just I misunderstood. Like, oh, oh, yeah. Man. Yeah, yeah, oh, that uh, is so cool. Yeah, it, 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 it doesn't just tilt it out. It actually brings it down to eye level. It's a oh, remarkable yeah. and, and And that's what idea. you need. If you're going to do it over a fireplace, that's what you need. That's the only thing to use. I mean, I wouldn't do it any <laughs> other way. Well, before we um, get to a couple more questions, I just want to take another moment to thank the other sponsor for our show today, uh, which is Netflix. And we were talking about Netflix earlier. Most of the people who uh, watch this show already have Netflix. They know about it. Uh, you can get it just about any device you want uh, from your on your TV uh, or your Blu-ray player, a game console, uh, Mac or PC, iPad, iPhone, just about any way you want. You can get uh, Netflix. You can stream thousands of TV episodes and movies directly, instantly, saving you time, money, and hassle. Uh, you can even watch on one device and then uh, skip over and finish on another device. If you're not a gamer... You can get an Apple TV or Roku. I mean, there's just tons of ways to get Netflix. And uh, all of them deliver uh, thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you uh, without any delay or having to return discs or anything like that. Um, and you can begin, uh, whichever way you choose, you can watch all, these, all this content 
directly. I find it very, very convenient myself, especially for things uh, that aren't readily available on disk. Um, and you can cancel any time. For a three, uh, free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Be sure to use this uh, URL when you're going in to uh, try it out for 30 days for free. And we thank Netflix for their support of the Twit Network. So um, let's see. We've got a little bit of time here for a couple more questions. Let's see. Uh, what are we going to be using to upscale to the Sony 4K projector? I honestly don't know yet. I'm hopefully get a, get one of those um, Onkyo or Integra pre-pros possibly. I haven't solved that problem yet, um, and it's sort of up to Tom Norton, although I certainly will help him any way I can. Uh, what home theater audio systems would you recommend for under $1,000, including uh, speakers and receiver for small to medium room? Well, there we're talking about a device called a home theater in a box, or HTIB. And uh, I think, Rob, you'd agree with me that uh, the Onkyo systems have been uh, probably at the top of our list. Yeah, you definitely took the words out of my mouth there. They, they've they done remarkably well in putting together not only a, a good, efficient uh, sort of midline receiver in these packages, but their speakers are surprisingly good, uh, you know, for a company that's not really known for, for loudspeakers. Uh, and, yeah. and these... Now, now they're they're not necessarily the the most beautiful and attractive things. The the speakers tend to be sort of fairly simple box speakers, but they they sound really good. Especially they also make some THX certified versions of that uh, up in around the thousand dollar area. And uh, exactly. That's a great, you know, we talked earlier about how much does it take to put together a great system. I have to admit, you know, if you're really on a budget, um, you know, that's not a bad option for a thousand bucks or so. So that's right. We had the uh, the last year's version, the uh, HTS 9300 THX, uh, among our top picks for home theater in a box systems, uh, but that's now been replaced by the 9400. And the good news is that one of our uh, primary reviewers, Kim Wilson, is now just now starting to take a look at the 9400. So we should have a review of that pretty soon. Right. Um, but it's around a thousand bucks. It's right around a thousand bucks. So. That's, uh, I, I have great hopes for it. Of course, we'll see, you know, with the, uh, with the review and everything. But um, uh, I, I expect it to be pretty good since all of the other ones that we've looked at have been really good. So unless Onkyo made a serious misstep, uh, we're, we're, looking, we're looking at something pretty good there. Uh, <laughs> Dar of Imur asks, uh, has Barb Gonzalez revered, reviewed the Roku 2 yet? Is it any better than the Roku One. Well, the good news there is she's going to be my guest on this show next week. And uh, she's going to be re bringing us uh, her impressions of the Roku Two. So I'm looking forward to hearing that. And I hope that you um, tune in for that. Um, let's see, what else can I do? Oh, are DLP sets still worth buying? That's a good question. And a related okay. question, what happened to uh, the laser TVs? Ah, yeah. Well, you know what? The, the, the LaserView TV, you know, there's very, very little of that out in the market right now. I do believe that um, Mitsubishi, which is the last remaining manufacturer of rear projection televisions, uh, DLP rear projection televisions, is, is still out there with some product. Uh, but uh, I, I know very little about what's left there. The, the LaserView was on the market for a very brief period of time. I do not believe it is still out out in the market. Don't I don't I don't know. I haven't talked to Mitsubishi in a while. I, I yeah, it may may still be out. I don't want to suggest that that it's not available. Uh, it was a very expensive television, and and what they were trying to do with that set was uh, use the purity of the laser lights to create uh, a wider color gamut uh, for the sets. And um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, the cost of it uh, was was just prohibitive uh, in today's market with shrinking flat panels. And uh, it, I'm not sure that the execution of the uh, of, of the wider gamut was really very natural at the end of the day. So hmm. um, all of those things, I think, just came to pass for it. It's really it's really too bad because uh, rear projection TVs have always represented a really great value. They, they were much less expensive than... Uh, comparably sized flat panel LCD or plasma. Um, but you know, they're just, they're too deep. They're people want thin. So well, yeah, 
Now, the, now that now that I'm thinking about it, the place that they are continuing to participate in that, they basically let go of everything that wasn't really, really big. So I believe it's 70 inches and up now in those rear projection televisions. You can't, for example, get a comparable sort of average everyday 50, 55 inch, 60 inch TV anymore in mm -hmm. the rear projection category. The idea there is to use the value that that brings to uh, the market uh, in the very larger screen sizes that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get. But to me, when you get to an 80 inch screen or an 85 inch screen, unless you have a real reason that you can't control the light, you better be looking at a front projector, so. Yeah, yep, I would agree. Um, let's see, Good Sound asks, will o when will o OLEDs be cheap enough for the consumer? <laughs> well, that's wow. a good question. <laughs> yeah, Can't say I, I know. I don't know either, I'm afraid. You know, uh, we continue to wait for OLED televisions to come to the market uh, in any reasonable size, and uh, they've still not been able to do it. You know, it's always been about the manufacturing with OLED and the yields on the, uh, on the, um, uh, uh, on, on the production of the panels. They can't get them punched out with enough of the pixels working to make mm -hmm. it worthwhile. Now, I will say LG announced that they would have a 55-inch OLED flat panel sometime in 2012. And oh, well, as exciting. I wrote in, which is very exciting, we'll probably see it at CES in January. And um, as I wrote in this week's poll question on hometheater.com, uh, I wrote about the rumored Apple television, which would likely be an OLED from LG as well. Um, I expect those to be in the five figures uh, because of what you just said. The yields are low. Um, so far, we've seen OLEDs that are no more than 20, 20 inches, and, and that only prototypes. So uh, I forget what the Sony was that they actually sold. Was it an 11-inch? It was Something an 11 like. inch, yeah. <laughs> For 2,500 bucks. Yeah. Jeez. Well, anyway, um, <clears throat> listen, unfortunately, we've come to the end of an hour, and uh, I'm sorry to those of you whose questions we didn't get to, but uh, um, I thank you so much for posting them. And Rob Sabin, I thank you so much for joining me to field as many as we actually were able to. <laughs> well, my pleasure, Scott. It's always great to be on. Thanks. Um, Rob and I are both at the same place online, which is uh, hometheater.com. Uh, you can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. As I mentioned, next week my guest geek is scheduled to be Barb Gonzalez, who will be ta telling us about her experience with Roku 2, as well as Google TV, the new software for Google TV and uh, probably some other stuff relating to online TV. So uh, I'm sure looking forward to that, and I hope you will join us uh, then. Until then, geek out. <laughs>